Good evening. My name is Sarit Katan Gribitz. I am an associate professor of Judaism in the theology department at Fordham University and the acting director of the Center for Jewish Studies this year. I want to welcome you virtually to our community and to thank you for joining us for today's event, a panel discussion about um, and that tells new doctor, documentary film, The Church, which tells the story of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in contemporary Jerusalem. I want to thank my colleague, Professor Magda Tedder, the center's director, for suggesting we screen this exciting new film and for all of her work behind the scenes planning this event and so many others this year. I want to thank my colleagues, Professor George Demokopoulos and Telly Papa Nicolau, the directors of Fordham's Orthodox Christian Studies Center for their partnership and co-sponsorship in this and so much else. And to Siobhan Verleza and Kelsey Miles for their energy and can-do attitude as we moved our entire program online in the middle of a pandemic. Finally, I want to express my gratitude to my panelists who are also my departmental colleagues and friends for generously agreeing to be part of this conversation this evening. They're a dream team with expertise in relevant history, theology, art, ritual, and interreligious relations from antiquity to the present. And I'm excited to be in conversation with them tonight. In a moment, I will briefly introduce each of our panelists in the order in which they will speak. And then each of us will offer five to six minutes of reflections about the Church of the Holy Sepulchre and the film that we've watched. We'll begin with the history of the church and its significance and quickly broaden out to discuss many other topics as well. We'll then respond to one another in additional reflections and finally engage with questions from all of you. Throughout the event, you can submit questions in the Q&A box and we'll answer as many of them as we can. Michael Peppard is professor of New Testament, early Christian studies and public religion and public life in the theology department at Fordham. He is the author of The World's Oldest Church, Bible, Art and Ritual at Jura Europis, Syria, and The Son of God in the Roman World, Divine Sonship and its social and political context. Michael's recent research has focused on ritual, art, and sacred space, as well as the legacy of women from the New Testament. George Demokopoulos is professor of theology, Father John Meyerdorf and Patterson Family Chair of Orthodox Christian Studies and co-founding director of the Orthodox Christian Studies Center at Fordham. He is the author of many books, most recent among them, Colonizing Christianity, Greek and Latin Religious Identity in the Era of the Fourth Crusade, Gregory the Great, Ascetic, Pastor, and First Man of Rome, and The Invention of Peter, Apostolic Discourse, and Papal Authority in Late Antiquity. Among George's interests are intra-Christian collaboration and the history of hymns, including those from and about Jerusalem. Sarah El Tantawi is Associate Professor of Modern Islam in the Theology Department at Fordham. She is the author of Sharia on Trial, Northern Nigerians Islamic Revolution. She's currently working on the rise of the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt from 1928 until the present, as well as a book of essays that tackle problems ranging from Islamic reform to spiritual offerings of Islam for American Muslims. Sarah joined the theology department this fall, and so it is a special honor for me to introduce Sarah to all of you and to express my excitement that she is our new colleague. And without further ado, I will pass the floor to Michael Peppard to begin the conversation. Thank you so much, Sarit, and, and thanks to the Center for Jewish Studies uh, and Orthodox Christian Studies for hosting this. This is a real good example of, I think, the Fordham Theology Department uh, doing what it does best, uh, which is uh, taking one of the you know important sites uh, from religious history and bringing to bear a number of different perspectives on it, uh, not only through our scholarship, but through the visual arts and the dramatic arts. So. I'm really proud to be a part of it. Um, I do want to say before I get into some scholarly stuff that um, I had, uh, I would say, two different viewing experiences uh, of, of this movie when I watched it. Uh, so when I watched it, uh, I was watching it next to someone for, for whom uh, she had a different experience. Uh, when I watched it, I watched it as someone who's been there, right, who's been to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, 
and who knows the history and was having a kind of uh, immersive experience in a place that I knew pretty well, but that also, uh, you know, I didn't know the sort of the backstory of the, the monks who live there and then the priests who live there and, and what like their, um, you know, their housing was like uh, about the Ethiopians on the roof. Uh, so there, there were to me some new moments for sure. Um, but I, I definitely felt like I was having an immersive sensory experience in a place that I sort of knew well. Uh, the person sitting next to me, on the other hand, was watching the movie as an American Protestant Christian who's never been to the Middle East. And so it was fascinating afterwards to hear this perspective. And, and what, what I learned was that the decentering of Catholics and Protestants, and really the decentering of Western Christianity uh, in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, uh, was quite powerful to her. The centrality, uh, on the other hand, of Greeks, of Armenians, of Copts, of Ethiopians, of course, relegated to the roof, uh, as we learned in the movie, but, but all these communities that I often talk about as a historian, um, but, but we don't necessarily uh, uh, see all the time in American Christianity. And then in addition to that, the engagement with ritual life, with vestments, with contact relics, that is, um, uh, items that... Uh, through contact kind of radiate holiness out to the person who touches them, the stone of unction, the Golgotha hill itself, really the materiality of religious faith to, to some uh, kind of Western and Northern Europeans, Christians, that might seem like a surprise. As a musician, I was very taken with the Armenian chant that we heard. Uh, Armeni Armenian chant has a pre-Gregorian tonal system. If you remember, there was a sound that was almost like pitch bending, almost a sound you would associate more with Central or South Asian melodies, music from India or something like that. Uh, this is this is a uh, part of the soundtrack that they were doing in the background uh, of the movie, and it it really gave it a, a multi-sensory sense of place. So, if the goal of the film is that of a travel documentary, namely to transport a viewer to a faraway place they've never been and likely will never go to inhabit its sights and its sounds and its smells and its conflicts and its drama. If that was the goal, I think the film was a, was a total success and I was really happy to see it. Um, the second point I wanted to bring up is about uh, something that might be a bit misleading about the film, which is that if you don't know the history of early Christianity in Jerusalem, this film implies that Jerusalem and even this church have always been sacred for Christians. And, and that is not, not exactly the case. In the New Testament, the earliest source of knowledge about uh, you know, Christianity in this region, in fact, uh, two of the four gospels uh, about Jesus, life, death, resurrection, two of the four gospels don't have much positive to say about Jerusalem at all. In, in, in Matthew and Mark, Jesus only goes there at the end of his life for one week, and it's not a it's not a good week, right? It's, it's not a, it's not a great experience, and he has a lot of prophetic um, prophetic speech against the authorities in Jerusalem. Uh, so so Luke has a more positive view, right? And, and Luke Luke begins Luke's gospel in Jerusalem and ends the ends the gospel there as well with a more positive view and doesn't have as negative. Uh, of words in Jesus' mouth about Jerusalem, but, but nonetheless, the, the New Testament evidence, I would say, is mixed, and Jesus is primarily portrayed as a Galilean, someone from the north, and not, not too connected to Jerusalem. So Christians then are gone for over 200 years after the Roman conquest, after a, a bunch of wars. We could talk about that more later if we want, but the, you know, this, this early Christian uh, presence uh, is gone for a couple hundred years until the uh, conversion of the Roman Emperor Constantine and the refounding of, of Jerusalem as a sacred place. And so my third point then is just to say that uh, what, what does uh, the movie really help us to think about? I think it helps us to think about theologically and historically how the Church of the Holy Sepulchre plays a major role in the propagation of the imagery of the cross. Uh, the imagery that we come to associate as uh, with Christianity around the world as the main image of Christianity, um, but it was not it was not obvious that this would be the case in the first few hundred years. It's not obvious that a symbol of state-sponsored torture would become a positive symbol um, for for Christian people. So, it's through the refounding of this church, through the rituals that happen there, 
through the establishment of the idea of Holy Week, uh, the week leading up to Good Friday and Easter, which really is, is very strongly anchored in Jerusalem. Pilgrims who go there, we know from the late 300s, a pilgrim named Egeria, the climax of her travel journal she describes is Holy Week. It's all of these liturgies, these little worship services happening around Jerusalem, culminating then in Good Friday and a procession to the cross. And at, at that procession to the cross, uh, people are, are, are honoring, it, honoring it. And she says that at one point, someone even tried to bite off the cross. So we have this materiality uh, that we talked about before. I talked about before this materiality of these contact relics. And the deacons had to stop people from biting off pieces of, of, of the cross there. The, de the deacons always get the hard jobs, don't they? Like, you know, marriage prep, <laughs> marriage counseling, preventing people from biting off the cross. Uh, no, anyway, so uh, I can't hear your, I assume you're laughing. That was the only joke I have. Uh, so I'm gonna, wrap, I'm gonna wrap up here, but say my, my main three takeaways were the two different viewing experiences. Uh, secondly, thinking about uh, some of the misleading feelings you might have about the role of Jerusalem and this church in earliest Christianity. And then third, the role uh, of this church in the propagation of the cross. And with that, uh, I'm gonna hand it off to my colleague, George, who knows a lot more of this history than I do. All right, uh, thank you, Michael. If it, uh, if it counts for anything, I was laughing. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so that, that was that was really helpful. Um, so my uh, contribution, well, first, let, let me thank Sarit uh, and, and, and Magda and, and the Center for Jewish Studies uh, for, for bringing us together and, and for making this film uh, available. Um, I, I don't know if everyone who's following the webinar right now has had a chance to see the film. Um, I would really encourage you to do so. Uh, whether you know much about the Church of the Holy Sepulchre or not, it's it's a really kind of fascinating um, account, told largely from the perspective of an Armenian um, priest monk, uh, who's one of the caretakers there. And what what I want to contribute to the conversation, and it, it must just be the whole situation must be so perplexing um, to to Americans and really anyone in the West, because the Church is. Um, simultaneously occupied um, by multiple Eastern Christian traditions that are not necessarily in communion with one another. And um, the so, so my contribution is going to be to simply explain a little bit of that. Uh, so as, as uh, Dr. Peppard uh, mentioned, um, it's really uh, the investment of the Roman Emperor Constantine in the early early fourth century that that uh, sort of makes Jerusalem um, a site, right? It makes Jerusalem important to the empire and almost immediately makes Jerusalem a pilgrimage site so that people are coming from all over the world, all over the Christian world, both inside the Roman Empire and beyond it to Jerusalem, and many of them are setting up monasteries uh, there. So we know, for example, by the early fifth century, there are, there's a Georgian monastery, there are Armenian monasteries, there are, of course, Greek monasteries, because that's the, the indigenous language of educated, uh, of, of the educated people in the East is, is usually Greek at this period. Um, so you have Greek monasteries, you have Latin monasteries, you have Armenian monasteries, you have Georgian monasteries, you have Syriac monasteries, uh, pretty soon you will have Coptic monasteries. So Jerusalem becomes this kind of cauldron of the multicultural, multi-ethnic, multilinguistic um, uh, reality that is uh, the late Roman Empire, uh, which is becoming the Byzantine Empire. And because, um, because the Church of the Holy Sepulchre is uh, effectively an imperial church, it's literally its original construction is paid for out of the imperial treasury, it means that the empire is going to have some control, right? Or imperial agents are going to have some control. It, it will be the pattern in the Byzantine Empire that the emperor is going to have a hand in the selection of any major Episcopal office. So whether it's Rome or Constantinople or Jerusalem, uh, the empire is going to have to, the emperor is going to have to, or his agent is going to have to sign off on whoever becomes uh, Archbishop of Jerusalem. And as a consequence of this, 
um, because you have all of these ethnic groups in Jerusalem, the heavy hand of the empire keeps them all in line, right? You don't really have any multicultural or multi-ethnic uh, um, contestation over the site. Everyone knows the site belongs um, to, the Arch to the Archbishop of Jerusalem, who is uh, appointed by the emperor. And, and that's pre pretty much the way it goes for centuries uh, until the seventh century. And in the seventh century, if, if, if you know your history of Western civilization, you will know that Arab armies um, come and conquer Jerusalem. And um, even though the majority of the population in Palestine uh, for the seventh and eighth century remains Christian, the, um, the political control is now with the emerging caliphate. And frankly, nothing really changes. Uh, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre remains in control of uh, Christians. Um, you still have these uh, multiple ethnic groups there. Um, and the, the legacy of who was in charge before remains in charge. So the Greeks kind of remain in charge because of their connections to empire uh, and, and so forth. What really changes uh, the situation is the arrival of uh, not the Arabs, but the arrival of the Crusaders uh, four centuries later. Uh, so at the very end, of the 11th century, beginning of the 12th century, um, Latin armies from the East come, frankly, not even knowing that there are Christians in Jerusalem. And uh, these armies uh, expel uh, the local uh, Christians who by this point are now speaking Arabic largely. Uh, there's some legacy of Greek. You still have some Armenians there. You still have some Georgians there, but the majority of Christians in Palestine uh, in the 11th century are speaking Arabic. Anyway, the Crusaders come, they expel all of these indigenous groups and they take it for themselves. Um, and then as Crusader fortunes arise and fall over the subsequent centuries, so too does the kind of jockeying for control of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Uh, and then um, centuries later, the Crusaders, uh, the crusading enterprise uh, falls apart, it collapses, um, and eventually the Ottomans control the whole period. And during the Ottoman period, the Ottomans um, were kind of notorious for playing different groups, different Christian groups against one another as a kind of divide and conquer policy. And so they sort of systematically allowed for control of the Holy Sepulchre to simply be purchased or, or bribed. And so you, 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 depending, on, depending on the moment in time, either the Greeks would have it or the Armenians would have it or the Ethiopians would have it um, and, and, and so forth. You heard reference to the movie, in the movie many times to the status quo, the status quo, we have to maintain the status quo. So the status quo refers to an agreement during the Ottoman period, uh, the year is 1757. And what the status quo does is it divides the ownership uh, or custodianship of the church um, among at, who were at the time in the 18th century, the three largest ethnic groups of Christians um, in, uh, in Jerusalem, um, none of which are in communion with one another. So those three groups would be the Greeks, um, the uh, Roman Catholics, uh, specifically the Franciscan order of the Roman Catholics, and the Armenians. And then um, there, there, at, at a later point in time, there is a sort of addendum to the status quo, which gives three additional groups uh, a small sliver of custodianship of the church. And those would be the Copts, the Syrians, uh, and, the, and the Ethiopians. Now, the, the movie, of course, is told from the perspective of, uh, of an Armenian. Um, and spends a lot of time um, dealing with the Ethiopians who, who, are, who are feeling displaced and so forth, and, and they are clearly, they're living on the roof and so forth. Um, but, uh, but it really is, uh, for those who don't kind of know this history, it's hard to understand uh, why it could be like this and why it's so contested. You have to understand that 
most of these groups are not in communion with one another theologically. And, and so that's simply, it, it's not just ethnic or linguistic difference, it's, it's also theological difference. And, and so that is um, a large part of the rivalry, um, but it's also just this kind of really, really, really intense um, uh, place of, of devotion and, and, and people um, are, are sort of um, compelled by that uh, emotion, I think. So I'll, I'll wrap it up there. And frankly, I, 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 I don't recall if Sarit's going next or Sarah. Um, I, I believe it's Sarit. Um, so I'll, I'll pass it over now. If I'm not mistaken, it's, it's me. Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> okay, Sarit, Sarit can chime in if that's not true. Okay. Thank you so much. I really appreciated that. I'm learning so much already. And I really want to thank Professor uh, Katan Gibritz Sarit for this wonderful invitation and to the Center for Jewish Studies and the Center for uh, or Fordham's Orthodox Studies Center. So I'm, I'm honored to be here and I really enjoyed this fascinating film and I'm um, happy to be in conversation with all of you about it. So I am um, going to bring you a little bit of history from the Muslim perspective. Um, as George just mentioned, of course, the, the Arab Muslim armies came in in the seventh century. And in terms of sources uh, that we have from the Muslim perspective, I'm going to refer to one called Tariq's Tabari, which is the most important history we have in early Islam. Of course, Islam itself is established in the seventh century. So one of the first expeditions of, of the Muslims is to Jerusalem. And in fact, the, um, the Muslim army at the time dispatched two of its uh, most storied commanders and, uh, and strategic thinkers, um, Khalid ibn Walid and Amr ibn Abbas, uh, Abr ibn As, to Jerusalem, which is a symbol of how important the city was seen to the new, the newly emerging uh, Muslim caliphate at the time. So the relationship with the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in particular begins in 637, uh, when these newly formed Muslim armies began to appear around the vicinity of Jerusalem. And at the time, Jerusalem was, uh, being led by, let's say, the patriarch, uh, the patriarch um, Sophronius, who is the representative of the Byzantine government in Jerusalem. So um, Sophronius saw himself surrounded by the Arab armies, but then refused to surrender until he could meet with the caliph himself, Omar ibn al-Khattab, who of course was in Mecca. So as the story goes, again, in the somewhat hagiographical history that we have, Omar comes to Jerusalem just with one servant um, on a mule wearing very simple garb and, and goes and meets personally with the patriarch Sophronius. Um, Omar was then, Omar ibn Khattab uh, was then given a tour of Jerusalem by Sophronius and including the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. When the time for the Muslim prayer came, Sophronius invited Omar to pray inside the church, but Omar uh, refused, again, according to Muslim sources. He insisted that if he prayed there, that later Muslims would use it as an excuse to convert the church into a mosque, thereby depriving Christendom of one of its holiest sites. Uh, again, so instead, Omar prayed outside the church, and today there is a mosque uh, that still exists right across from the Church of the Holy Sepulchre called the Masjid Omar, the Church of Omar. So a treaty was signed between Omar and Sophronius, and uh, I'll actually, it's very short, I'll read you the treaty. So it's, it, it reads, in the name of God, the merciful, the compassionate, this is the assurance of safety, which the servant of God, Omar, the commander of the faithful, has given to the people of Jerusalem. He has given them an assurance of safety for themselves and their property, their churches, their crosses, the sick and healthy of the city, and for all the rituals which belong to their religion. Their churches will not be inhabited by Muslims and will not be destroyed. 
neither they nor the land on which they stand, nor their cross, nor their property will be damaged. They will not be forcibly converted. No Jew will live with them in Jerusalem. The, the people of Jerusalem must pay taxes like the people of other cities and must expel the Byzantines and the robbers. Uh, those of the people of Jerusalem who want to live with the Byzantines, take their property and abandon their churches and crosses will be safe until they reach their place of refuge. The villagers may remain in the city if they wish, but must pay taxes like the citizens. Those who wish may go with the Byzantines and those who wish may return to their families. Nothing is to be taken from them before their harvest is reaped. If they pay their taxes according to their, to their obligations, then the conditions laid out in this letter are under the covenant of God, are the responsibility of his prophet and of the caliphs of the faithful. Signed, Omar ibn al-Khattab, and again from the great Arab conquest of Tariq al-Tabari. So this Muslim goodwill uh, did not continue, unfortunately, um, uh, around the time of 1009, just before the Crusades, when the Fatimid Caliph al-Hakim ordered a number of the churches of the Holy Land to be burned, including the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Um, al-Hakim's son then approved the rebuilding of the church in 1128. In 1187, about 50 years later, uh, the great Salahuddin al Ayyubi, who is revered in the Muslim imagination as the reconqueror of Jerusalem for the Muslims, um, of course, after the Crusades. So he reconquers Jerusalem in 1187 and moves to right that wrong of the previous Fatimid Caliph by making sure that the church was not harmed by fellow Muslims and therefore at that moment gave the key to the church to the uh, very well respected Al Husseini family uh, living in Jerusalem at the time. And as we see from the film, that is the same family that has had custodianship over the key to this moment, which is a very revered um, sort of honored, an honor, you know, for the, uh, in the Muslim imagination. So I do wanna make a few comments about the contemporary context. I'm gonna skip ahead about a thousand years. Uh, just in closing, just to think about, uh, to zoom the lens out a little bit um, from the frame of the movie and just think a little bit about uh, the, the current state of the context of the church, which, which is in East Jerusalem, um, which is part of the Palestinian territories. And this part of Jerusalem is currently under occupation. And so it's important to say a few words about the Arab Christian Palestinian community I believe the only person we see in the film from that community is the police officer. Um, but other than that, they're not prominently featured in the film. Uh, just to say a few words about that community. So for Palestinian Christians, the church is also part of their local custom of worship uh, and has been for about 900 years. Um, the greatest majority of Palestinian Christians are Greek Orthodox. Um, and the second largest number are Catholic. So it's about 46% Orthodox, Greek Orthodox, about 40% Catholic, 20% of whom are Roman Catholic, 20% of whom are Eastern Catholic. Uh, currently there are actually tensions. So none of this is in the film and I just thought I'd bring it in because it's a, a wider picture. There are tensions between the Palestinian Arab Greek Orthodox community and the Greek leadership of the church because the Palestinian Christians are actually often denied access to the church. While as we see from the film, um, international pilgrims are often granted greater access than the Palestinian community. And this is something that creates uh, tensions between the Palestinian Greek Orthodox and the Greek Orthodox who are custodians of the church. So that might be something that would be interesting to delve into. Um, a final note I'd make about the, the wider current context is a thought about the Middle Eastern Christian community uh, more broadly today, which sadly in our current age of ISIS and wars in Syria and Iraq have suffered greatly and are immigrating in distressingly high numbers out of the region. The Palestinian Christian community, um, somewhat by contrast, because of their shared struggle uh, against occupation, with the Palestinian Muslim community have a much better interfaith relationship than let's say average uh, in the region now. And the, the honor of Muslims holding the key to the church 
can also be read as a potent symbol of unity in the context of that shared struggle um, in this wider context. And it's one that's really deeply symbolic and important on multiple registers and really has a depth of, of time as well in terms of the, the kind of symbolic value of holding that key. So I'll end there. Thank you so much. Thank you um, to, uh, to all, all three of you for sharing your thoughts. Um, I wanna pick up on threads that the three of you laid out by asking um, further, what story does the film tell about the Church of the Holy Sepulcher and what stories does it not tell or rather what is missing from the film? As is clear for those who watched the film already, it's about the Church of the Holy Sepulchre as a place of intra-Christian denominational collaboration, tension. It's about how different Christian communities navigate the challenge of sharing a single sacred space. And that's a fascinating story in and of itself and very well told, I think. But there are also many other stories to tell about the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. And I wanna spend a moment reflecting on two such stories. The first is a story of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre as a space of women's history and devotion. And the second is a story about the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in a religiously diverse city that often finds itself in the midst of intra-religious and political conflict. So I want to note these dimensions not to criticize the film, but on the contrary, to highlight how the film prompts us to ask um, and to think carefully about so many additional aspects of the church's history. So let's begin with the first story, the church as a women's space. Women are largely almost entirely absent from the film. The only voices we hear are those of men, monks, police officers, the custodians of the key, um, though we do see many Christian, uh, many pilgrims, women pilgrims in the, in the footage. This is the case even though women have played an important role in the history of the church from its very earliest moments and that so many chapels and other spaces within the church are dedicated to those women. So let me give you a tiny taste of this history. According to Eusebius, Constantine built the church as part of his broader program of Christianization. But a few decades after the construction of the church, the narrative of the church's construction shifts so a popular tradition circulated about Constantine's mother, Helena, who traveled to Jerusalem in quest of the Holy Cross upon which Jesus had been crucified. And when she arrives in Jerusalem, she finds the area of the crucifixion to be desolate. And she makes it her business to discover the cross. Um, it's a whole story that happens um, that involves actually many women, including that the cross heals a woman. Um, Helena builds the Anastasis, she sends relics of the true cross across the empire, and she institutes a feast um, annually commemorating the finding of the true cross. So today, when you walk to the church from the Jaffa Gate, you turn onto St. Helena Street to enter the church. And according to this legend, it's Helen, uh, not Constantine, who builds the church. So um, Egeria, uh, one of our earliest pilgrims to Christian Jerusalem that Michael mentioned, describes the liturgy in the city when she celebrated the feast of the finding of the true cross, the very festival that Helena is said to have instituted. But Egeria wasn't the only prominent woman pilgrim to recount her journey to Jerusalem and her visit specifically to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Bridget of Sweden, visited Mamluk Jerusalem in 1373 and Marjorie Kemp from England in 1413. And both women devote significant attention to their, in their pilgrim narratives to their time in the city and especially the church. Jesus appears to Bridget in a vision, encouraging her to travel to Jerusalem to visit the church. And the first time that Bridget steps foot in the church, she has a revelation in which Jesus assures her that anyone who comes to the church asking for forgiveness will have their sins forgiven. And Marjorie, for her part, is so moved by her experience in the church that she weeps and she falls to the ground. She cries so loudly that she, quote, sees in her spiritual sight the mourning of our Lord, of St. John, of Mary Magdalene, and of many others. And the legacy of these women persists in the contemporary church. So if you visit the church today, a pilgrim will encounter many spaces 
that commemorate traditions about women in the church. The altar of Mary Magdalene, for example, marks the spot where Mary Magdalene met the resurrected Jesus. And a set of doors leads to the Catholic Franciscan chapel of, of the apparition, the spot where the resurrected Jesus appeared to his mother Mary. The chapel of St. Helena, an Armenian chapel constructed during the Crusader Kingdom of Jerusalem, commemorates Helena, while the chapel of the invention of the true cross, um, a, a Roman Catholic chapel, marks the spot where Helen discovered the true cross and there's a statue of Helen within it. Then there's the chapel of St. Mary of Egypt, a Coptic chapel that celebrates the story of Mary of Egypt, who like Egeria came to Jerusalem for the feast of the exaltation of the true cross in the late fourth or early fifth century. But unlike Egeria, Mary is portrayed by her biographer as a promiscuous, sinful woman, someone who came to Jerusalem not for worship, but for business. And it's at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre where her conversion story begins. A mysterious force present, prevents her from entering the church, and when she sees an icon of the Theotokos, she repents. And she's venerated to this day in a chapel that's dedicated to her within the church. And then there are many other spaces, the station of the three holy women, the arches of the Virgin, and so on. As you might have noticed, many of these spaces within the church belong to different denominations, Franciscan, Armenian, Coptic, Roman Catholic, and so on. And so the gendered story of the church is also part of the denominational story. And let me very briefly turn to the second story about the church as a sacred space in a city full of sacred sites. The, the film begins and ends by situating the Church of the Holy Sepulchre within the city um, with a panoramic view of the cityscape in which the Dome of the Rock is most prominent um, uh, in, in the skyline, but there are many other churches and synagogues and, and mosques within it. Um, but the, fo the focus of the film is of the space as an intra-Christian space. The only Muslims mentioned in the film are those who unlock the, ch the church doors. Um, and in my recollection of the film, there are no Jews in the film whatsoever, even though the church is only a few hundred yards from the Western Wall, Judaism's most sacred site. Um, yet the church has always existed in explicit relation and often in contrast and competition to other religious traditions. And this too is an important part of the story. So let me just give you two examples. When Eusebius writes about Constantine's construction of the church, he also notes that Constantine did not renovate the area of the destroyed temple across town. That area labeled the old Jerusalem in contrast to the new Jerusalem, um, which was Christian, was to remain desolate. Theologically, the juxtaposition of the glorious church and the destroyed temple mount came to symbolize for many, on the one hand, Israelite sin, and on the other hand, Christian supersession. And finally, there's the story of, um, of the Muslim Caliph Omar um, that Sarah mentioned, who upon conquering the city, or declines to pray in the church so that it wouldn't be turned into a mosque. And he prays just outside of it. Um, and when I pass the mosque on my way to the church, when I'm in Jerusalem, it reminds me of the efforts that it takes for different religious communities to find creative ways of living together in a small city. And the church continues to stand at the center of such interreligious dynamics. So within the church, it feels like its own world. It's disconnected from the rest of the world, even as it gathers denominations within um, within its walls um, and denominations and their tensions from around the world. And the film really captures that really well. Um, but then standing at a distance, uh, glancing at Jerusalem's skyline, even architecturally, we can see three um, many domes, among them the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, the Dome of the Rock, the Chorva Synagogue, um, all in dialogue with each other, competing and complementing and so on. And that's a, an additional important context for, um, for this film. So I'm going to pause now um, and we're going to open up for um, a discussion among us and, and answering um, all of your questions. Um, so if I could ask um, my my co-panelists, if there's um, anything that you want to add um, to jump into the conversation, um, and we will also ask um, pose all the questions that um, all of you listening um, have been sending us. 
Sarah, George, Michael, anything to add before I before I ask um, the, the first question? I actually uh, had a question for George. Would that be okay? <laughs> Just because of George, you, you said that the status quo was um, set in the Ottoman period, which is what I always thought, but in the film, um, the monks said British. Did you have any theories as to why that happened? Well, from, from what, <laughs> From what I know about the status quo is that it was first um, it was first uh, instituted in the 1750s and then reaffirmed in the 1850s. I assume the 1850s uh, mark, marks the British period and, and that's what they're referring to. Um, that, 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 that's that's my sense of, of, of what it is. Yeah. Uh, Sarit, I had I had a uh, one image I might share as we're talking about the absence of women from you know from this from this film. So I'm just going to share my screen for for I think this will work. Uh, so I took this picture, you can all see that. I took this picture when I was last at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre because I hadn't never no I had never noticed it before, but I hadn't been looking before because I hadn't been doing research about the history of Mary Magdalene in early Christian art uh, until, until this last time that I was there. And this is currently uh, above the altar of St. Mary Magdalene. And what, what, I just pulled it up while you were talking and, and the reason I wanted to show it is that it's a pretty radical departure from hundreds of years of imagery for Mary Magdalene. So if you don't know how that, how she's depicted most often in early Christian art, she's usually in the scene of the resurrection depicted on the ground. She's, she's on the ground, either kneeling or laying down and, you know, beholding the risen Jesus. Um, but it doesn't have to be that way, right? There's that, that's a choice that artists have made throughout, throughout history. And in some of the research I'm doing, I'm trying to isolate how that came to be. But this is a very, a much more positive posture, right? For, for her, uh, standing upright, uh, addressing, addressing Jesus, hand on her heart, kind of as he gazes up to heaven, describing his ascension, she's looking right at him and even looking up uh, and kind of a, a, much, a much more of a posture of faith. So I guess I, uh, I wanted to, to present that because it, it shows to me how we're talking in this panel about how multi-layered the history is of this site. And even here we have late 20th century art that's being commissioned to kind of replace and update based on, based on Roman Catholic views that have changed, that are changing about, about this very spot where, where this pivotal encounter happened. So, I thought I might uh, just share that one. I pulled up some pilgrimage art too, but I don't know if we uh, if we want to if we want to go there. Um, well, uh, can, can I ask um, a, a great question that someone posed about why was it not Bethlehem or Nazareth that became the focus um, of Constantine's Christianization efforts, or or at least why was it Jerusalem that became um, the holiest place in the region for Christians. Uh, I, I can take a shot at that and then Michael will correct me. Um, so uh, the, the fact of the matter is, is that when Constantine is commissioning this church, Christians are not really celebrating what we call Christmas. Um, the, the, the nativity of Christ is not a, a, a big feast um, uh, uh, anywhere on par with the resurrection, right? The, the, the entire Christian calendar is framed by the resurrection, both yearly and weekly. And, and so the resurrection of Jesus, which occurs, at, right, his death and resurrection occurs in Jerusalem, is simply so much more significant uh, than, than the nativity. I don't know why you defer to me. This, this panel is stacked with calendar experts. So I, I, I would, I would say, uh, uh, yeah, I would say that's definitely right. I mean, everything is built around Holy Week and Easter, and Epiphany is even attested earlier than than Nativity in terms of uh, history of our of the calendar. So that's one good example. As as to Nazareth, 
that's a that question is more is uh more challenging right why why would jesus have why would constantine and others not look to nazareth as a place to locate um a site of holiness and certainly we have later pilgrimage narratives that do we have later um later pilgrimage narratives that um focus on the annunciation for example uh, the annunciation to mary the announcement that she would give birth to jesus at nazareth um, but I'm not sure about uh, about whether there were attempts to to do something as as you know earlier than the medieval period in Nazareth. Um, so I have I have um, one other set of questions um, uh, on the Christian side, and then a question for Sarah um, about the source that you brought. Um, but first, let me ask. Um, there's a question: Who are the Georgians, and how do they fit into the story? They were so prominent in the film. And then another question, where are the Protestants? Um, I think both in the film, but where are they actually in the church and in relation to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre? So I'll, I'll do the Georgian question and Michael can do the Protestant question. <laughs> um, so the, the, the Georgia, so uh, Georgia is, is um, you know, today it's a, it, it's a nation state in, in the Caucasus. Um, uh, so uh, near Iran, uh, it was a province of uh, the Soviet Union and, and so forth. Um, and the Georgians had, um, Georgians had a monastic community in Jerusalem, just like all of these ethnic groups did. Christianity was in Jerusalem, uh, was in Georgia. Um, uh, it's ancient, right? It, it's, it's among one of the, once Christianity spreads, um, it's one of the places that it takes hold. One of the reasons the Georgian is significant is all of these groups are, uh, they're worshiping together um, at, and, and separately. And one of the sort of interesting liturgical facts is that the oldest surviving Christian hymns uh, or hymnals that exist uh, only survive in ancient Georgian. Right, so the ancient Georgian texts that survive are older than any Greek or Latin uh, or Syriac manuscripts. Um, so, if you want to be like a liturgy expert, you have you have to learn ancient Georgian. Michael, uh, did you want to take a stab at the um, the second question? Throw, throwing to me, um, I, I'm certainly not an expert in in what happened in the 1800s uh, regarding these sites. But the basic story, and, and then we'd, I'd have to do more research to find out the exact story, but the basic story is that the Protestants do not have a foothold in the Church of the Holy Sepulcher. Uh, they're far too late to the party, right? I mean, we're talking about uh, hundreds of years before the Reformation where these things are getting established. And even, even when the status quo is established, there's still not much of a Protestant foothold in uh, in the Middle East. So what, what Protestants often, what they often go to is what's called a garden tomb. So this is a, a second competing holy site, um, not far from the Holy Sepulchre, that uh, when Protestant Christians from Europe or America go on their Holy Land pilgrimage tours, uh, often involves a stop at a, at a different competing site. Now, Sri, you, you've lived there, you've lived there many times, so you, you may know more than me about that just from just from being there or from your own history but that's my sense of things is that there are competing holy sites and that that is uh completely within the christian tradition <laughs> and the pilgrimage tradition of competing sites uh, i mentioned the annunciation earlier there were competing sites of the annunciation already in um uh in the sixth century i believe i, I think in the piacenza pilgrim i think there are competing annunciation sites in nazareth so so that's that's not just a modern phenomenon um, yes, I'll, I'll just echo that um, there are Protestant churches, including very close to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, to make up for um, their lack of presence in, in the church itself. Um, one question um, that was asked in various forms um, is about the treaty that you read, Sarah, um, and questions about um, the difference in um, treatment of Christians and Jews um, in, in the letter and sort of what the backstory is with that. Yes, that is a very good question. 
Um, so I can take a somewhat educated guess on that. Um, and please, all of you feel free to, to correct me or add to what I'm saying. Um, so the era in which this was signed was right in the midst of uh, Byzantine Persian Wars, which were going back and forth. And um, in general, my impression is that the Jewish communities felt that they fared much better under the Persians in this particular moment than under the Byzantines. So I read this. Um, so this is Omar drawing up a treaty with the Byzantines. He's drawing up a treaty with those who are in power in Jerusalem at the time. Um, and so he, whatever omissions, I mean, there's a mention, the only mention of the Jewish community is that they will not be, let me say it exactly. Um, no Jew will live with them in Jerusalem, meaning the Byzantines. So my reading of this is that that would be a Byzantine request. Um, now, that's a different question than what happens to the Jewish communities. Uh, all I can say about that, and please correct me, is that my impression is that they would not have been unhappy, uh, relatively speaking, about this treaty. Yeah, I'll jump in um, and, and add um, and add to that, which is that in um, there are rabbinic sources from this period um, that uh, both from the Byzantine Persian Wars and also um, from the early Islamic period that see um, the Islamic conquest as potentially heralding a messianic. Um, redemption um, because the Jewish community had not been um, um, happy under Byzantine rule. And so there was this um, sort of uh, expectation of a better future. Um, and, and so we have texts that imagine both in, um, in, the, in the late seventh and eighth century um, and, and, and during all of these wars sort of apocalyptic thinking about that. Um, one of the um, questions that um, that I ask in my class on Jerusalem, and here I just want to give a shout out to my students who are listening right now um, for really a great um, conversation about this movie this morning. Um, we ask the question, like, why why did Jerusalem become important for a group of people in the Arabian Peninsula? Right, um, like it's not. Um, it's not something that we can take for granted um, that Mohammed and his followers would have thought of Jerusalem necessarily as a sacred place. Um, and if we historically contextualize it in the P Byzantine Persian Wars, one of the things that we realize is that during Mohammed's lifetime, Jerusalem is at the center of an international conflict. And it's a conflict in which the true cross is being taken out of the city by the Persians and then it's being brought back into the city by the Byzantines. And so we think about sort of modern analogies like Jerusalem is in the news when Muhammad is growing up. And so it makes perfect sense, right? That this becomes an important city also within a, a, a Muslim theological and historical context. And so um, that's sort of just to add um, uh, yet another part of sort of the Byzantine Persian Wars being uh, an important part of that early story. I can add something small to that, which is that um, putting on the theological lens. Uh, so theologically, Islam is trying to frame itself as in the Judeo, let me not call it, in the Abrahamic tradition, right? So this is, there's a real um, eagerness to, to frame itself as a tradition that way in the Quran. And so as such, uh, actually Muslims were commanded to pray toward Jerusalem. I completely agree with Sarit. There's really no theological reason for it. I think except for Abrahamic. Um, and, then, uh, and then of course the decree changed and Muslims were ordered to pray toward Mecca. Um, but there was that moment of actually um, facing Jerusalem. So. 
Um, we have many, many questions. Um, so we're not going to be able to get to all of them, but let's try to answer a few more. Um, one question um, that was posed was about um, the Ethiopian presence in the church and the history. Um, I don't know if George, you have um, something to add about that. Uh, so I, I have to confess that that, that I really don't. Um, I, I I think I'm I'm safest simply to say that I wish I knew more about it than I do. But but it, it, they they were excluded in the original status quo, um, and I don't they've they've since uh, acquired space there. I don't know. I simply don't know of any claim that they had, that's not to say they didn't have one, but I don't know of any claim that they had prior to the 18th century. I, I, I just don't know that history. Um, there's, there's another question about um, how do the relations be among the faiths and the denominations within the church and the disagreements and the tensions that the film highlights, how do those affect worshipers around the world? Is that, are those tensions specific to the space of the church itself or are those tensions felt in sort of a, a global Christian context? So I can't take a, a, a shot at that. Um, so one of the things that's, that is interesting is that, so of, of the six groups that have some claim on, on the church, right? Roman Catholics, uh, let's call them Chalcedonian Orthodox, which, you, you know, the, they talk about Greeks, but that would include Russians, Serbians, Ukrainians, etc. right? Um, so uh, then you have the Copts, you have the Armenians, you have the Syrians, and you have the Ethiopians. Of those six different groups, three of them are actually in communion with one another. That's the Armenians, the Copts, and the Ethiopians. And one of the things that is most interesting about the film is that one of the greatest moments of tension that the film captures is actually between the cops and the Ethiopians. And they are in communion with one another. So that is one of that, I, I found that to be one of the more interesting elements of the film that even though they are in theological communion with one another, um, that they are still competing over, over this space. Could I, could I just say one thing about, um, you know, we were talking a lot about the Armenians in this, in this, in this panel and, or, and in the film, it's our, our Armenian narrator. And I feel like, I don't know who's watching out there on this panel, but people in the future are going to be watching it, I think, in our classes and things like that. Something that I did not know until I was well into graduate school is the antiquity and distinctiveness of Armenian Christianity. And the fact that our, they, they are not only not latecomers <laughs> to this, but they are one of the earliest Christian places on earth and that they have been in Jerusalem since the 300s, you know, and, and that, and that um, so in my study of history of liturgy, history of ritual, uh, it, it's been amazing to me that the uh, the bishop the the bishop of Jerusalem in the three thirties is writing letters to Armenia and they're talking about oh what's the right date for baptism and can we baptize on Pentecost or can we only baptize on Easter I mean our, and so I, I just want to kind of li lift that out of the texture for those of us who are just hearing a list of like Armenians Ethiopians Copts. They're all they're they're obviously all important, but there but there is an Armenian quarter of the old city. There's a you know the cathedral of, of Saints James and kind of the mon the monastery. This very strong, very ancient tradition, and and I think that it it made a lot of sense to me when they used that when they used the Armenian as the narrator to kind of make sure the viewer appreciated that you know appreciated that that heritage. I think for me, one of the things that um, I appreciated about the film is that it's fo it focused on intra-Christian communities, meaning that when we think about Jerusalem, we think about Jerusalem as a city that is sacred to Jews and Christians and Muslims. Um, but, but when you sort of zoom in and you zoom into one church, 
Um, and then you see, oh, it's it's actually sacred to all of these different Christian denominations and communities. And I think if you zoomed in in a different part of the city, for example, if you zoom in to the Armenian quarter, what you would find is that there are different Armenian churches and different Armenian traditions, and that those two have their tensions um, and, and disagreements um, quite significant. And, and that is also true if you zoom into any building in Jerusalem, right, whether it's a Jewish synagogue or the Western Wall or the Haram Sharif or, uh, you know, the, the Sufi uh, places in Jerusalem, that, that there are, um, that each of these communities is really complicated and, um, and diverse even within it. And so it, it gives us a little bit of a sense of that. Um, so can I jump in here really quick to connect something to connect what you're talking about to something Sarah mentioned earlier as well, and, and this question of how is what's going on at this church impacting broader inter-Christian um, engagement? Because um, Christians are leaving the Middle East in droves, literally, um, one of the interesting things that is happening probably everywhere in the Middle East except around the Holy Sepulcher is that these ancient, and we're talking, you know, fifth century, these ancient divisions between Christians are uh, in practical terms evaporating. Um, so Christians uh, for the first time in the 20th and 21st century in ways that had never really happened before are intermarrying, they're intercommuning, uh, and, and they're largely doing it with the tacit approval of their bishops on all sides, simply because um, they're, they're, they're very survival in the Middle East is at stake. So while the tensions and the competition for the Church of the Holy Sepulchre is very, very real and palpable, the the tension between um say you know the legacy of the byzantines and the armenians or, or the cops or the syrians uh are in practical terms in in lived religion in the middle east are largely evaporating um i would like to pose one last question as a way of sort of wrapping up um, which is about the film itself. So we had questions about what was the purpose of the film or why why did the film have the particular um, lenses that it did? And so I'm curious to know from you both um, from your experience of watching it and, and, and so on, um, either like what purpose does this film serve or why might it have been produced? Um, but also um, what do you, um, what are you left with or what are some of the, the bigger takeaways uh, of the film? I think for me, uh, I'll, I'll reiterate one of the points that I said earlier, which is that it fulfilled the goals of a travel documentary to a pilgrimage site that most people will never see the inside of. Even if people make it to Jerusalem on a travel, it doesn't necessarily mean they're going to walk in that building. And even if they walk in that building, they might get overwhelmed by the crowds and feel like, oh, this is a weird place. Uh, there's too much happening here. And that guy's yelling at me and this guy's sweeping me away and I'm going to get out of here. You know, to, to, to really be immersed in, in, this, in this crucial and holy place um, with, with this multi-sensory experience. I think that for my, my main, one of my main takeaways relates also to my first time being there myself as a, as a college student on a trip, which was a sense of utter foreignness. I felt that it was a very foreign place, even as someone who was Christian in all kinds of ways and all kinds of rearing and education. And I think that the film does that for, for people uh, that they, you know, that they, most people who see it from outside of that area will be surprised by some aspect of foreignness, uh, even within a tradition that they, that they might think they know. And I think that's a great value. Uh, I, so um, the, the, the one thing, I, I guess I wanna use my final comment to, to, to speak about a character in the film that we really didn't talk about, and that's the policeman. 
Um, so, so this is an uh, Israeli citizen who is a Palestinian Christian, not not Greek, right? So, Ar Ar you know, it, it, Arab Arab speaking Christian Israeli citizen, and. When, when I think about the film, like after I see it, I, for, my mind goes to him. And I just, I get this sense and, and, and it's certainly true for, for the Armenian priest too. They just feel this incredible sense of responsibility, right? Whatever fate or fortune or luck or, or divine providence or whatever, put these very ordinary people um, into ex extraordinary roles, <laughs> right? And, and they're just going, they're just trying to do their job of, of, of preserving um, a, a holy space and preserving it in a way that as best as we fallen humans can handle it, can all share um, and, and benefit from it. And, and, and so, um, yes, the movie is, is, is a travelogue and it takes people there, but it also, it, it gave me a sense of that kind of responsibility that these, that these caretakers have. Um, I, I'm not sure I have a very profound closing thought on it, except that I've been, I've been to Jerusalem a few times and I, I love the church, I've been to the church I think all of us who have been to Jerusalem um, might know, might recognize what I'm saying here in that, you know, it's a place that's much more than the sum of its parts. You know, it's, it's small. Um, now I'm talking about East Jerusalem, right? Um, there are people walking around in all kinds of religious garb, um, it, taking it, you know, it, it, with the utmost seriousness of the three monotheistic faiths and then the subdivisions therein. Um, it is very beautiful and very tense and a sense that things are hanging by tinder hooks kind of on multiple levels. So, um, but also incredibly beautiful. And the one thing I appreciate about Jerusalem is that it's a place where the history um, really seems to overwhelm, well, I was going to say overwhelm the politics, but of course that's not true, but in the sense that, um, it, it, it's it's just a deep place. Um, and and so um, when I I guess when I think about the film for me, the the tensions inside of the church were just a micro I mean again, coupled with the beauty is just a microcosm of the rest of the city. <laughs> so that, that that's kind of how I think about it and you just kind of leave with a feeling that, I hope the status quo holds, right? You know, in, in multi, on multiple levels. Um, so yeah, it's if it does hold, that means that um, that living with many many different people is possible, different kinds of people. Um, I I want to sort of bring what what all of you said together in, in my reflections, which is that. Um, when I saw the film and when my students talked about the film this morning, uh, we very much thought of it as sort of being in the tradition of pilgrimage narratives and geographies and travel accounts. So right, Egeria and Marjorie and Abbot Daniel and Evliya Chelebi, who was um, uh, in the Ottoman period, who, who was a geographer and El Mukadesi and Benjamin of Tudela, all these people who come to the city and who record it. And one of the impulses that they have to record is to um, narrate the city to people who can't get there. And that has been the case for financial reasons and for distance reasons and for all sorts of reasons historically. Uh, but there was something like very moving about watching it in the middle of a pandemic when um, we can't really go anywhere, um, let alone to a place like Jerusalem, um, and when the church itself has been closed. And so there's something really beautiful about the scene of the holy fire, where it really felt like you were there. And in part, it felt that way because so many people were recording themselves with selfie sticks, with cell phones. And so it really felt like being a part of that experience um, and, um, and, and sort of the, the fervor and the excitement of the pilgrims 
was a little bit contagious to me, at least as, as a viewer. Um, and then also this like deep care for the place by all of these people who, um, who are there as figures of authority. So I thought that was sort of an interest, interesting to see the film in that sort of very long tradition. Um, and then picking up on what Sarah said, um, the film as really um, a film about Jerusalem um, as a city, but using the church to tell that story instead of telling it in a more conventional way. Um, and I, I wanna close with the one of the last or maybe even the last scene of the movie um, where um, we go down, we hear you know, the church is this international place and it's a place of um, ritual and pilgrimage and liturgy and yet it's also home to the people who live there and we go down I can't remember I think it's down the stairs and you keep going and to me it felt almost uncomfortable how close you get to where um, the monks sleep um, and then they say like goodbye at the very end and so there was this sense of um, like this city and this church being home also um, and, and sort of really an intimate way of ending and I think the the combination of it being both an international city and also like the place where someone at the end of the day goes home and goes to bed um, was was captured in, in the movie in interesting ways. Um, and, and the idea of like, it's hanging on by a thread and there are so many people who really care about it and um, are trying in, in some way to, to, sustain, um, to sustain it as a place of like home and belonging. I want to thank everybody for joining us. I want to thank Michael and George and Sarah. Um, I want to uh, thank everyone behind the scenes, Kelsey and Siobhan and Magda, um, for um, for everything um, to make this uh, day possible. And um, for those who haven't seen the film, um, I encourage you to find a way of seeing it um, and to continue these conversations. Um, I want to also remind you that we have an event this Sunday celebrating Nina Rowe's book on um, medieval cities and books about medieval cities. Um, and, um, and I wish everybody a good night and thank you again. <laughs>